And I'm going to talk to you about the data darkness in BC that you have lived in for so many years. Uh, and we're hoping to shed some light on that. Uh, talk to the power of data that can happen within your businesses and breweries and maybe some stuff you didn't know and maybe some stuff that you did know, but you want to be able to leverage it in its best, uh, best shape and form. When I build uh, presentations, I've done a lot of presentations sort of through my career, you kind of get two directions. One is going to be, and see, look at this, I already got it, eh? Like, mic in, mic out, doesn't work. Anyway, uh, you get two types of presentations for me. One is going to be, I got very few slides and I just talk a lot about what's going on in those slides. The other is the bombardment of slides. And that's what you wonderfully get today because your short attention spans aren't going to last for like, you know, eight minutes a slide. So I got to like, you know, TikTok you, Twitter you, Snapchat you, like however it's going to be. Uh, that's how we're going to keep this interesting and keep it going ahead. So uh, what we're going to be talking about today, again, data, how that relates to sales, marketing, and revenue management for people who don't have a RevMan team, which most of you don't. Uh, that's your finance person who's yelling at you for not bringing in enough money. Uh, what we're going to talk about uh, analyzing data, uh, how to evaluate the data that you have on hand. And then unlocking sort of some potentials that are out there. I'm going to swap hands. I think I like the mic in the right hand. Uh, really, all this is coming down to is that a lot of us have been operating off of a gut feel. And that gut feel gets us very far. Uh, it's the intuition. It's the intuition that we've had by attending seminars. And somewhere it's logging its way into our brain so that when we're in a boardroom or a meeting room or sitting at the table with our partners, we're pulling upon that and we don't even know where it came from. It was just in that space, right? Uh, that gets us so far and data is what's going to help you get going further, right? So this is all about supporting you. I'm just, I'm here to be supporting this group here to help you make better business decisions so that, you know, when you're working with your limited resources, when you're trying to stretch and reach those new goals, that you're going to have that uh, right at hand. So, a little bit about me and why I'm up here talking with you. Uh, I've had the honor of working on many great brands in my career. Uh, I started in the wine industry, uh, fresh out of university, and it was incredible. I got to try some incredible wines. I've had bottles like Camus, you know, on my wine shelf. And I quickly realized that I cannot afford to work in the wine industry because your palate and your taste way accelerates your income and your price range. Moved on to advertising and got the opportunity to work with uh, United Distillers, which is Diageo now, uh, and got to launch brands like Johnny Walk Gold, uh, which was very cool because, you know, in high school, university, you know, you'd have like scotch and you'd be like, oh my God, that's like fire down my throat. And well, I had a year or so working in wine and had to appreciate wine took in those, all that learning. And when I was at an event and we're launching this and I'm like, I can do it. I can drink this stuff. This is going to be okay. And I'm standing there with my client and, you know, we have a little toast and I swirl it and I look at it and I look at the legs and I put them out and I aerate a little bit. And then all of a sudden I swallow it and I'm like, oh my God, keep it together so that you don't spit this in front of your client's face. Um, so I realized that spirits wasn't the world for me. So beer it is. Uh, I got the opportunity to work at Labatt uh, and Heiserbusch InBev for the, the global side of things and absolutely loved it. It is a learning factory. They pump so much knowledge into the employees and the people there. Uh, it's fantastic. The beer, it's not the point, uh, but it's the knowledge that you take out of that. So my very first day working at uh, Labatt was they do a brand performance review on day seven of the month. And then day 10, they do a sales performance review. And then two days after that, they do a commercial performance review. Again, grand enterprise scale. Um, but that meant every month for five years that I was there, I was doing a three-day analysis and presenting it to a group of Brazilians who use like a lot of big words and loud words and jumping up and down. And it's fantastic because it, it, just means that they're excited, they care, they're passionate, and you're always trying to build what's the best out of this data set. So I carried that through. Um, sorry, I am the person who launched Bud Light Lime. 
Um, I spent $14 million in three months launching that brand. It was uh, pretty exciting. Um, for anyone who deals in the world of scarcity, you know, it got to a point where, you know, we had stocked out so quickly and, uh, was sitting there with the, the VP of marketing and said, well, we got no product. And he's like, yeah, we don't. And he's like, should we, should we cut back our media budget and all the spend that we're doing? And we're like, yeah, let's pull it all forward and like spend more. And we ramped the hype out of this, like bigger than anything. So, um, doesn't have to be great beer to get great sales and uh, great opportunities. Uh, so finished my time at Labatt, uh, moved on to Granville Island Brewing. So getting myself one step a little bit closer to the small world of craft. Uh, Granville is fantastic. The brewery, uh, wonderful people there. Um, had a, a wonderful time running that brewery for five years. Uh, and then I got the loving luxury to be uh, pulled over to Vancouver Island Brewing, uh, where I spent uh, five years there as well, uh, running that brewery, being a partner uh, with the folks there and really helping to turn that ship around after having uh, many challenging years for that brewery. So again, analytics and data, all steps along the way, uh, all of this really to help us get to the point of like, what am I gonna do with the data, right? How am I gonna move things forward? My clicker doesn't work, so it's a manual person in the back to see that flashing light that indicates it's like it's like analog. It's like a laser to like point over to them and go, next slide. If you could progress the slide. <laughs> I think every time I push the button, it's supposed to progress the slide. Hi, Jeff. You want to turn around and tell our wonderful tech support guy that we... Okay, cool. Um, so why are we here? Uh, in fact, the big question is, is, why are you here? So let's get a little bit of audience participation. Hands up, you're in marketing. Too funny if it's like this side is all sales. Hands up if you're in sales. <laughs> okay. Uh, and hands up if you do both and also like run the brewery. Yes, wonderful. This is the audience that we want to be talking to. Um, a lot of you probably built plans that had a growth chart that looks like this, right? Man, who, like, why would you ever build a business plan that, like, showed you leveling off or, like, you know, declining over, like, a period of time? Well, that is sort of, you know, as we look at businesses, your growth can look like a progression, right? And if you anyone looks at US data on some of the biggest brands in the world, this is their trajectory. They've always just done this. None of them came shooting out of the gates. All the ones that shot out failed, right? They eventually like slow down and collapse. Uh, so you're looking at charts of growth and saying, I'm growing like this. I'm curving. I'm coming across. Or what a lot of people are experiencing, these. These charts can come across as twofolds, which is we launched a new brand, we got great excitement, then things stalled. Next new brand, great excitement. Um, if anyone saw Adam's presentation yesterday, which was fantastic, talking about Superflux uh, and their growth, stretch this out as a bigger side of your business, which is, wow, I grew to 2000 hex and I was able to do that using one strategy, but then all of a sudden I started losing. And so I had to adopt a new strategy. And that's a lot of the businesses and that's a lot of the organizations in the agency world. It's the $10 million cap. As soon as you hit $10 million, 50% chance you're going to go bankrupt, 25% chance you're going to get bought and 25% gets through. I would love to figure this out for the brewery world and be supporting this team with that because I believe there are benchmarks and tiers. The unfortunate thing is we don't know where those lines are. So it is going to help you understand, but it's the strategies that you pull out of it that are really going to help you push your business forward. So we're not talking doom and gloom, right? Again, that's the reason why I called out to Mandy when she did her presentation today. It's like, you, you, like VRBO and Airbnb are not two competitors that entered your space. They represent like 10,000 competitors, each of them within those spaces. But it is true, beer is suffering, right? It's been on a slow decline. This is this year's data. 
I got a thing that comes in and out of here, but either way, the dotted line is last year. The blue line is this year of beer. So you, you can see what is a typical trend here on the light blue. This is your refresh Bev, right? RTDs. Wine takes a little bit of a dip through the summer while everyone loves refresh and loves their beers. And then spirits have a similar type thing. They have a little slower period as they go through the year. So looking at this data, you're just sort of getting an understanding of how your industry is doing. But as we look closer, this is now a comparison of regional brands as deemed by the L, you know, uh, BCLDB uh, and our micro brands. Regional brands, solid is your this year. Your dotted line is last year. Micro, this is your dotted line is last year. And your green line is this year. You're having a tough year. It's a reality. I don't need to say it. You're the ones who know it from your bank accounts and how the business is running. But again, the indicators are knowing what's going on in the industry and how you're going to adapt and adjust because it's a reality that everyone can win. Everyone can succeed in this space. If anyone's played poker and people have heard my story of a chip in a chair, yeah, I've done that. I've been there with one chip remaining as everyone else had the pile at the table. And I came back and I came back and I changed my strategy as each along the way. And I ended up winning the entire table, right? And all I had was a chip in a chair. So I, I'm a believer. That's my story. You have to find your own stories of what's going to make you believe that every step that you go through this journey, you're going to be coming through on the winning side. So I'm just going to share a little bit here on what is the importance of data as you look at each of these different sections. Um, sales, hopefully everyone has looked at a normal sort of sales chart. You see your performance of your individual brands and how they uh, span month to month and go through the seasonality. There are some businesses that, oh, and by the way, I work at a data intelligence company and we collect data across, you know, but I'll give you a little spiel at the end of that. Uh, but that's where these charts are coming from. And so we're looking at private store sales. Um, and as we look with some competitors, um, they're getting a better understanding and a better lens of what's out there. And this is now becoming available both through the company that I work at and through the BCLDB uh, that's sharing data, there's just doesn't look as pretty. Um, but what we're you know able to do is give people a share understanding of how they're performing in the marketplace versus their competition. Um, these are just things that you'll never understand what I grabbed, but it just gives you a general sense of sort of how to compare. So you don't know what I'm comparing because those are made up of different SKUs in different regions. So please absorb as much as you can and make some guesses and we'll make a lottery guess at the end on who picked it, but there's certain people who aren't allowed to pick in that. So what is the, what's the data from sales doing for us, right? It is making the decisions on where we're putting our people resources, right? Where are we putting our sales efforts? Where are we putting our merchandiser efforts? Where are we putting our budgets to support these things? And most importantly, where is production, right? What is production that the ask of sales and the relationship with production is absolutely the one-to-one -one relationship, right? Production, who's your biggest customer? Sales. That's it. They're the ones that tell you, you know, I'm going to sell it and this is what I need from the organization. So that funnel of information coming from sales needs to be driving that. And, it, and again, as your breweries change and grow, Early on, it's just, I got product and we just need to sell it. But eventually you're going to get to those different stages and levels where you need to be understanding which regions are going to sell it the most and who's going to be driving the best revenue for you. On a marketing front, uh, for all our marketing folks, they would know sort of data coming from Facebook, right? You get it from Instagram, you get it from, you know, a handful of the sites that you do promotions through, you can get data and understanding. Uh, I don't know what's the joke with Facebook. It's all like, you know, retired moms or something like that. So uh, really hard to get a clear understanding on what that database uh, set looks like uh, within the, the industry. And it does vary across province to province. There are some provinces that share a lot of data, such as Ontario. 
Um, BC gets to a little bit of that now with sort of what they're sharing and Alberta is an absolute nothing in terms of what they're sharing. And so other great data that's available out there from a marketing side of things is taking a look at what are your brand pairings, right? So I pulled good old Parkside because uh, Vern's a good buddy of mine uh, from working at Granville Island Brewing. And you take a look at what are the interactions? Like what's my brand pairing up with most? Right. So what are the interactions that are happening between my brand and how we can establish is we can look at this across any industry. So how do you pair up against spirits? How do you pair against wine? How do you pair against uh, the entire category set? And really what this is helping you understand is how do you find partners? Right. How do you, you know, the simple, the simple way is collab. Hey, let's do a collab. People like drink our beer together. It's like more an understanding of like, what are the partnerships when you're walking up to a customer and saying, you should be putting us in the flyer beside them because we interact very well together. And in fact, maybe we should be doing the promotions side by side near each other. And that's going to drive some of your best revenue. The column or the chart on the right uh, starts sharing out, you know, what is a demographic split? So within the data set that we get, um, half the liquor stores, half the private stores in BC uh, generally have a loyalty program in place. And so we're able to look at it and break that up to identify what's a female consumer, what's a male consumer, what are their choice preferences. And again, these are done on the purchasing side. This is not surveys. This is not asked, you know, what would you purchase more? What would you purchase less? It's getting right into this is what they have thrown into their shopping basket. And this is what uh, is truly making those de those decisions. Marketing obviously impacts packaging design, uh, beer styles when looking at trends that are happening in the marketplace. Um, it gets into partnerships, it gets into a in events. Uh, sponsorship activation is something that a lot of breweries, big, small, medium, uh, get into that sponsorship side and the events that they show up at because they want to make sure the target audience that they are appealing to is going to meet their brand needs. And lastly, because we have no finance people in the room, but salespeople will probably be paying attention to this. Uh, you're taking a look at, I hope you're taking a look at outside the lens of your own building, uh, is looking at the price of your competition. And yeah, sorry to tell you, they are the competition. Like you are now a mature industry that you work in. Your brethren that are beside you are your besties to have beers with and hang out. And God, I think it was, I can't remember who it was that I was chatting with. He basically said, we're all friends in beer, except our salespeople fight each other. And it's totally okay. Uh, and it is okay. It is okay to be like living in a healthy uh, environment. And we're not stealing from Labatt and Molson like we used to. A lot of those people have moved over. The generation that is going into the LDA, legal drinking age, has been exposed to craft deeply already versus 15, 20 years ago, the people entering it had never even known what the flavor of this type of a beer is. So um, I say that just to make sure that people are looking at their competition and understanding, you know, build out your comp set of who you think that you interact with and connect with and know what they're doing from a pricing standpoint. Um, the bottom chart just sort of takes a look at, you know, what is their average price that's going to be out into the, on the, on the private market? We know what the LDB does. It's like listed. That's the price. It doesn't change. Uh, but in that private store market, uh, there's lots of variability that happens a lot of variability that happens when you put things on LTO and they decide to not put it on LTO, or they'll say, I'll take 50 cents in my own pocket and give you 50 cents, you know, out to the consumer. So uh, lots of data that exists in that space to understand LTO penetrations and how effective they're being for you. Uh, lastly is revenue management. And I love this slide so much. Um, I'm a marketer by heart, you know, and uh, so I build like, I don't know, a thousand presentations in my life. That's probably even a small number. Uh, I have always done all the slides of every presentation that I've done and got some, you know, support on, uh, on this deck because I want to make sure it was polished and slick and everything. And then I saw this slide and I went, hmm, that's interesting. 
it's not sure they're shoving beer into that bag. Um, but hey, you know, we never know. Uh, looking at revenue management, again, the finance team uh, really just driving those sales uh, in terms of what's going to be the LTO strategy. You know, again, it's working between sales and finance together uh, to understand what is the price, what is the formats you want to put into the marketplace, and what's the, the uh, LTOs that are going to go along with it. Okay, so uh, in the world of evaluating data, this is the right one, yeah. Um, we're looking at, you know, there's four stages to it. So there's the collection period, right? Where you're just gathering as much. And again, this can be as complex as the 44 million transactions that we're like ingesting and, and taking care of. It can just be simple stuff like you're grabbing input from customers and consumers. Um, but there's a collection period. Then there's the cleanup, right? get rid of the dirty stuff, get rid of the ugly stuff that's not relevant in the mix and then organize it, right? Get that organization going, clean it up, organize it. That's what analytics is, is the organization of data. And then the last bucket is the insights, right? And that's where you start identifying patterns and you're starting to see similarities that are happening across different areas that you're really going to start driving to go, that's an aha moment uh, that we need to act upon. So to put that into terms, it's like, you got to start with what's your problem, right? It's very simple. Um, there's lots of, you know, kind of expressions that we'll use in business and, and across any organization that is just sort of, you know, hey, if you don't measure it, well, then you can't, you know, uh, you can't grow it, right? Like all the different expressions. I'm like, if you don't know what your problem is, then how are you going to solve it, right? So... A lot of what needs to go in, you know, again, the sharpen the ax, the spend this much time doing this, like this work on the front end before getting into the process is so critical, important uh, within the brewery space. It's determining what that problem is. It's then brainstorming around it on just what are those big ideas that you're going to act upon and then moving into well, what's the next layer, right? What's the next layer that we can kind of ask upon ourselves and then you start getting into that analyzing of that da data, the diagram, the space, and I'll get into uh, what that kind of can look like. Uh, because I'm old, I got to put up old references. So for nice work, love it. Um, oh, is a song that'll get people to like dancing and getting them out of their pants. Um, this is a fishbone. It's something that I've used for years. Uh, for those who have seen it, um, it can be repetitive. And then for those, it's just like a go-to that they're constantly using uh, within their business. So the idea of the fishbone is you start with your problem on the left-hand side. We kept it very simple and generic. Um, and then each of your spines is pulling a piece of your business, right? So how is the BCLS doing? How is private doing? How is our mix pack performance doing? How are we doing on the island? All of these areas can be broken out onto how's performance of, you know, HR doing, how's our pack line doing? Like it doesn't have to be directly related to the sales. It can be directly related to the business because you could have had logistic challenges that you're trying to overcome, or you're looking at different areas of the business that are new and hopefully developing growth for you, right? So tap rooms, patios, spaces like that. And then it's over to the team to start populating into these spaces, right? We look at a new West Coast IPA. Do we have a velocity change, right? How many customers do we have? Do we lose customers? Do we got more customers going? How are we doing on untapped, right? It's like, hey, uh, no one uses untapped anymore. Well, you don't have any other data. So pull upon like what you can learn from, right? Because if you're keeping your apples to apples, then every data is great. If you're trying to compare someone's performance on untapped with someone else's performance on rate beer, well, yes, you're going to have some problems there. But um, really this stage is that brainstorming. It is the questioning within the team. It is trying to understand all the possibilities. And please, when you do these exercises, do not edit on the go. It is not about turning down ideas. It is about getting everything on the board, right? The reason why it is everything on the board, because it is a domino effect. 
Someone brings up one idea, stupid idea, but the next one can be, huh, never looked at it that way. And then it cascades into an incredible idea and opportunity for everyone. So please, when in that exercise of brainstorm, trying to figure out everything that's going on, you just got to get everything onto the board and the board is the critical piece, right? That's where we talked about, like, analyze the diagram, analyze the visual. How is this going to look? People need to be looking at their businesses and just being the kid again. Like, be that kid who constantly asked why. Be that person that is constantly questioning what's going on. And they're not, they're not negatively questioning. They're just questioning to ask. Right. For anyone who has read the book, The Power of Why, anyone? Wonderful. Um, it talks about how Canadians have a hard time asking the question why, because we feel that it's like it's being like aggressive to someone and, and that you, you then all of a sudden you're going to be on your back heels. Well, find a different way to use the word why. We know how to use words like how and what and you know what we think we were trying to achieve when we were doing that. But we have to have to ask those questions. Um, for anyone who's sort of seen innovative workshops, um, anyone that's been in the space of like SpaceX or Project X, there's a gentleman named Peter Diamantis. And Peter basically, you know, he was asked on stage, which was actually pretty interesting when you have an audience of 2000 people asking him a question of like, what are you going to teach your kids now knowing that AI is like here and that people are going to have a chip in their head that's going to access them to Google and that they can, you know, get anything they want. And he's just like, ask better questions. That's it. That's what I'm going to teach my kids. Right. And so we need to be challenging ourselves and asking ourselves these questions because that's how you're going to get to the root cause. Right. So what was the problem? Well, I was late for the conference. Well, why were you late for the conference? Well, I missed my ferry which is kind of funny because people missed the ferry yesterday because the ferry didn't go at 7 a.m. Um, well, why did I miss it? Well, I slept through my alarm. Well, why did that happen? Well, I stayed up too late. Well, why did you stay up too late? Well, because I host a backyard brewery in the Beast at my house every year uh, after the event, and this year's theme was fresh hot beers. Okay, well, why is that a problem? Because there's way too many fucking good fresh hot beers, and so you get too loaded at night. Um Getting yourself down to what is that root cause helps along that fishbone, right? So whether your fishbone's asking more questions of why as you're moving along the spines, whether it's the questions that came out of it and said, is this really the thing that we need to be understanding? And we look at this example here, you know, our sales are down. Why? Oh, we lost distribution. Well, why'd we lose distribution? Well, it was a mixed pack transition and we just didn't perform that well. Well, okay, well, why is that? Well, we had a gap in our sales team. And a lot of people just stop there. They just go, okay, we, we, had, we had a gap. That was our problem. We had a gap. Okay, well, those are really hard to like, you know, solve. But what, why did we have a gap? Well, we lost it to a competing brewery that had a better territory for that rep. Well, why do you think they did that? Well, they had a little bit too much screen time. Like they just, they were driving all the time, like covering too large of a territory. Oh, so maybe we didn't establish what are the clear priorities for that sales rep and understand like what are the tier ones versus the tier twos versus the tier three clients that they need to be visiting because we just lost a great rep, right? And so as we're asking those questions of why and filling our way down that pipeline, we just always need to be ensuring that we're getting to a place that can be, okay, that's a root cause. And now we need to build around the solutions. Right. So it's not about getting to the root cause and it's just you leave it there. No, the root cause then becomes your area for brainstorming and building around. Right. We're all going to run into this pathway could have gone down. Well, we we lost distribution. Why we lose distribution? Well, because we had a production problem. Right. Well, why do we have the production problem? So it's not always sitting just in sales's court to go, sales didn't perform, you know, like. It's, it's, you know, shoving them in that corner and telling them that it was a bad job. You know, looking at other scenarios is you start to look at other data that you had collected and you say, well, actually our mix pack was struggling because the, our other two main competitors were both on sale that month. And we just, 
lost out entirely during that period. Oh, okay. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to know better when they're on LTO. Oh, great. Well, they're never going to share that. Well, I don't know. We could talk with Zach and Dave Pearson. And when we worked at Vancouver Island Brewing, we mapped everyone in our competition's LTO strategies. And we would follow it for years until we identified the pattern and went, that beer is always on this schedule of LTOs year after year after year. And you're like, okay, so now we know. Now we can make the adjustments to say, do you want to challenge them? Like, do you want to go toe to toe and go, we're going to do an LTO at the same time they do the LTO? Or are you going to do the opposite approach, which is, no, nah, I'm going to let them have their LTO and we're going to hammer hard the month before they go on that LTO to fill the shelves, to get a bigger deal in place so that, I don't know, maybe you pack the shelves too much, maybe you had too many end dial displays. Sorry if we pushed out the other person during their LTO period, but that's a bit of the game that you need to understand is that there are a lot of working pieces that you have a lot of levers to pull in play. And it's all just about understanding and getting those uh, pieces of data on the board to start identifying patterns. So gathering data, kind of touched on some of these. We all have our internal shipments. So I understand how our currency and our money's moving around. The LDB does now share data. Uh, they've shared reports before in terms of what are the top 1,000 stores in the marketplace? What are the top styles of this brand? They were very like clear on not giving you a lot of detail. So they're like, we'll give you a three month range or we'll give you like a, you know, an estimated range on these ones, but it's getting tighter and clearer. Um, as I mentioned, Untapped uh, is another great resource. Again, you just open up the app and see where brands are listed, right? You all of a sudden are being able to see, oh, how many taps does these accounts have versus mine, right? And again, it's not a perfect representation, but it gives you arrows and indications of maybe something that you need to dig into a little bit further. Uh, the LDB stores, the website, who's been to the website to see their competitors' distribution? Nice work, nice work. That's like the awesome ABCs. You just like go onto the website and you're like, click brand, where is it available? Oh, they're in 110 stores and I'm only at 80 stores. Looks like I had a gap of like 30 stores that I need to close out, right? So find the data where it is. You can also, I know people who maybe have gone a little bit overboard with that. Weekly, they would go in and look at the inventory at some of the key stores to understand a run rate of how they may be turning through those locations. That's deep. You need a lot of time, sleepless nights. Uh, DIY. Uh, has anyone hired summer students to go and take pictures of bars and restaurants to understand their taps and what the tap penetration is of your competition? Wonderful job, Dave. Um, yeah, like summer students pay them in beer, they're never going to say no. Like you can get people out there working for you. I've had a number of times, like now phones are a little bit more common. You like take pictures in a liquor store and people aren't going to be like, what are you doing? You're a spy. Like before I used to like pretend like I'm on the phone and be taking pictures all the way along. Uh, we don't need to do that anymore. People know that people are taking, oh, it's my best friend's favorite drink. And I want to let them know it's here. So, um, you know, Go take the pictures, see the shelf sets, right? How are you being shelved? Get that into a system like Dave can talk about in the craft CRM space. Uh, get those images in there because your sales rep need to know how am I being shelved and is it changing in a month when I go back in there and all of a sudden it's like, hey, look, this was I was up here and we were performing great together. You know, why did all of a sudden I shift? Uh, ride alongs, customer discussions. You know, again, I talk about uh, that production space. It's, you know, you want to be getting into the marketplace. And now I'm really talking to marketing people because I know salespeople are already in the marketplace. Uh, but marketing people need to get into the marketplace so that they can solidly understand how the brands are performing. Ask those questions. Not how's my brand performing because they're just going to tell you it's performing. You want to know how you're performing versus someone else. How am I doing versus their IPA? I see their IPA is cheaper than mine. Do people still buy mine as much as theirs? 
just know any data they share with you, like insights and observations, they're sharing with the other guy too. There's none of this like, who he told me a secret. You're like, yeah, well, he's telling everyone that secret. So um, not, not, to, uh, not to get too excited around what's being shared and thinking that they're not sharing your own stuff. But again, it's what you're acting on when you get those insights um, or that data. Okay. So we have all those data sets. We have all those different areas where we can grab and attain data. Uh, we've looked at the, the fishbone. We've looked at the whole space uh, in terms of what we're trying to achieve. You know, now this is the insights part, right? Like it, it really gets into um, understanding patterns. It's about finding sort of connections that are happening between uh, different parts of the organization. So, um, this is an example. It's it actually a cleaner example of probably one that, that we've done. Uh, but it's just get everything on the board, right? Write it down, put it on a post-it note, put it on a scribble. If everyone's working off their own laptops at a table or off their own phones at a table, there is no connectivity that is happening within the group. We can't read your minds. We don't see your screens. You got to get this stuff on the board so that you can start circling things and go, funny, this thing's happening and it's happening over here too. What do, what's the connection place, right? So these are very much like, you know, does it take a certain mind to do it? No, but it takes many people in the room with different minds to achieve it. My mom's calling me. Well, you had a presentation, mom. So very much... I am a visual person. I came from the agency world. I was in marketing. This is my wheelhouse. If we were showing this to the finance people in the other room, their minds would be blowing up. They, I always have to like give them extra candy and, and stuff when they're in a meeting with me because they know my mind is just working at a bigger scale, but not bigger scale, sorry. An uncontrolled scale, let's put it, put it that way, um, so that I can truly pull upon any great insight and possibility. And uh, again, being at this conference uh, has been fantastic for that. You know, I'm present, I'm attending, I'm going to, to the seminars, I'm seeing everything because I'm looking for identif identifying opportunities for my business and looking and going, hey, Brett, what you're doing is like totally tying and it's going to help everyone here. How about we create this together, Right. And you're not going to get there unless you're actually present and you're working into these spaces. So uh, happy to do many doodles and demonstrations for everyone. You should see my notebooks that I work off of. Um, 80-20, it's a reality, right? Uh, you're going to build out this monster list. As I said, do not edit. Please do not edit as you're going along. Uh, save that for the end because any idea is going to be turned into a great idea as you funnel through. So take a look at it and then go to your editing phase. And in fact, don't even throw out the garbage that you thought was garbage. Take a picture, log it in somehow. You don't have to retype out the whole thing, but just document it because you may reference it one day and it takes nothing to take a picture. Um, there are the 80s, right? They are the nuggets that you're like, oh my God, if we actually act upon these one, two, three things, it's way better than us stretching ourselves to try to do the 20. Like, don't even try the 20. Because in fact, some people even think like, oh, I'll do the three and then I'll get to four, five, and six. No, by the time you're done the three, you're onto a whole new world of problems and opportunities and things. So act on those three, commit to those three, get that 80% done. And you, that's where you're going to see those rewards. Okay. AI. So again, I'm from beer. And then I tell people like, oh yeah, I work in data intelligence and AI. And they're like, what? <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was three months of, well, it still is, uh, three months of solidly drinking from a fire hose of trying to understand data and the analytical space and the tech tools that we have. And trying to bring all of these to what is the practicality of why is it relevant to this room? Why is it relevant to the industry? Um, there's a, a ton, ton of opportunity. I'm thankful I stayed in beer while I did it and not learning about I don't know, medical equipment and data AI and stuff. Um, but these are three areas that are your opportunities, right? So um, hands up for anyone who has used ChatGPT. 
thank goodness. I was dreadfully worrying that like half the people were going to put their hands up and just be like, okay, we got to have a talk here. Um, because it is all about starting to work with it, right? Uh, in any form, any form, it is how that needs to be looked at, right? Um, anything I tell you about AI is going to be changed by the end of this session. So a lot of what... <laughs> Again, the AI conversation that I'll be having with you is there's a lot of companies that are using it. You don't have to be an algorithm AI person. You don't need to bring that into your organization. But organizations that are using it, organizations that are leveraging the power of it to help you out, very much listen to them. But it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Ask great questions, right? I go into chat GPT. What are the three best beers to pair with a cheeseburger? Here's the answer I get. Here's three that, you know, consider. Uh, India Pale Ale, nah, nah, nah. American Amber Ale, Stout Porter. It's like, okay, well, what if I ask a better question? What three BC beers, best contrast, Jamie Oliver Burger recipe, three Jacobs cream cheese, ch bleh, cream <laughs> cracker, eight sprigs of fresh leaf parsley recipe and you get a little bit of a better answer given the ingredients of the jamie oliver burger recipe the savory elements of dijon minced beef, the cheese the gherkins and the fresh elements of the parsley lettuce and tomatoes here's what you get and so we gotta know what our problems are we gotta know how to ask those better questions so that we're very clear on what we want as the outcomes, right? If we're just asking these surface questions, you're just gonna get surface answers, right? And as you've seen across lots of the seminars, lots of the presentations, Mandy's fantastic one this morning, talking about brand and values and visions. Well, I could have put into the question, and I want brands that are more outgoing and more outdoorsy and see what kind of answer I get. Right. So constantly get into that space and start asking those questions in different ways, because that's what you need to be doing in your own business is asking the questions in different ways so that you are going to drive a difference. Right. I don't need to be the good old like, I don't know if it's Einstein or the other guy, but, you know, the definition of insanity. Right. If we just keep doing the same thing, the same ways and expecting different results. Um, this is a great way to play, <laughs> go play. I've done some amazing chat GPTs. I had the chat GPT write a poem and a song about a group of dads that we all ride together, mountain bike together. And we get together and we tune up our bikes and our family bikes on Wednesday nights and drink beer. I just put that question right into chat GPT and it wrote a song and a poem for me. Like it's amazing. But the first time I asked, I got a garbage answer. So I'm like, hey, I'm going to ask it a different way. Just keep asking that different way and you're going to get different answers out of your team. And that's what you're looking for as you're filling out that fishbone and as you're trying to figure out the root cause. Again, my titles are a little bit blocked off here, but basically this is just getting into automated marketing, right? So we're all probably using automated marketing in one way or another, which is whenever you're populating Instagram or social feeds or anything like that, that you build a schedule and it does the work later on, right? Or if people are doing an action, what is the following action to come out of that data interaction? Um, there's now more technology out there that geofences areas. So you can have an interaction that is, hmm, I'm going to drop a geofence at the top of Full Nelson in Squamish. And so when people get up there and they've got like one of my passes, that it's going to trigger a note that says, hey, good for you. We've got a cold, fresh beer ready for you when you get down to the bottom. And you're like, that's pretty damn good. Or what about an island brewery that's having a concert and knows that a number of mainland people are going to be coming over. Do you geofence the ferry? It says, welcome to the island. Or the opposite. There's concerts going on in, you know, on the mainland and you're geofencing around that. So a lot of these interactions can start becoming programmed already to just act upon people's uh, behaviors and how they're moving around their lifestyles. So 
The key here is that it's not adding more work to people that already have limited time, right? You build a set of rules, you build a set of guidelines that you want for it, and you walk away and it works for you, right? And those are those opportunities that you need to be looking for in the world of automated marketing. Next is real-time data. People will love this. People in the front will get a better visual than the people in the back, unless the people in the back have really good eyes. Uh, I thought what a fun way to demonstrate real-time data is just run the daily uh, share of each of the brands that have launched a fresh hot beer. So that is the share performance. And what it means by a share performance is, you know, I think this is Cannery. Cannery first out of the gates. So they were 100% of the sales, right? Um, all the brands start filtering in and all of a sudden we start seeing who's dominating the share of sales across each of those um, different uh, different breweries and different products. My apologies if you launched a fresh hot beer and you didn't use the word fresh in it. I was being fast when I was searching these and not using AI to generate a full list of the fresh hot beers. Why is this important? Well, not really for fresh hop. Like who cares? You make it, you sell it, it's done. But what happens when you're a brewery and you're launching a new summer brand and you're putting it out into the marketplace and it's to hopefully represent 20% of your growth next summer? Mm, when do you get the data to help you make those decisions? Six weeks out? Eight weeks out? So you're eight weeks out for when you launched in the summer. How many weeks of summer do we get? Yeah, not 40 so you need to be acting, you need to be knowing, right? It's very easy for me to show a chart of shipments. We all know it's like, oh, well, I loaded in store 100. I loaded in all the shelves. Like, great, when's the next order going to come? I don't know. When, when it does well, how big is that order going to be? I don't know, as big as I went to a customer and he said it was doing really well. That doesn't help us make data decisions, right? We need to know this can be a make or break for a brewery in the summertime. If you can all of a sudden see that the velocity of your brand is performing on point with your top performing one already or on point with one of the top competitor brands already, you know you got to win. You can't wait and even to wait and have it done six weeks later, eight weeks later, it's just another shipment spike. And you're still trying to understand like how successful, how successful are we being with this, right? And again, it comes down to then comparing store to store and how does that doing a month after the game? So the real timeness, this is just a fun demonstration. The real time is a real serious piece, right? It impacts a lot of our business. How much are we putting in, you know, can, how much are we putting in draft? Um, there are big financial decisions that come along with those things. So real time, real time. And then that says, collect your own data. Uh, there's a number of vehicles for you to start collecting your own data with, right? So we have a suite of tools that, that we work in in the Wallet Pass technology. Uh, FOB, we're one of the largest Wallet Pass providers. Uh, we've identified a, a, a tech stack that allows us to have multiple passes. So for anyone who flies and travels and has tickets you know, to concerts and you flick across, well, that flicking across technology is what we're bringing to all businesses, uh, big and small. Uh, it is very approachable for many people, but you're the one collecting the data now. You're the one who's understanding where are these people from? What are their patterns of buying? We start putting into place little surveys so that you can understand what are their styles that they prefer. And all of a sudden you're the ones who are collecting data. Other great places are free Wi-Fi. Anyone offering free Wi-Fi in your brewery taproom space? Yeah, there's technology that you can work with that actually does that as a lead gen that they need to give you some information in order to get the free Wi-Fi. Again, you're just collecting all the data, right? And it's how you use it and not abuse it um, really comes down to how well that can work for you. And that's me. Thank you very much.
And I, I did say to Ken, and we did make a fair handshake on this, that this was not going to be an infomercial because I know a number of people were like, please show us all the data that is out there on what's going on in our beer industry. Um, I am happy to have conversations with people. I'm happy to chat about things. Um, we are um, trying to work with the guild to understand, like, how is there a place that we could provide some reports? Right. How do we provide like either a broad stand on what's happening in the industry um, or, you know, what's happening on certain uh, different times of the year or just sort of helping out um, as the businesses and breweries are growing and, and ever changing. Uh, again, Phoebe, uh, how we work is we've partnered with half the private retailers uh, in the province. And so right now we've collected 100 stores data dating back to January 2022. So we can give you year over year performance data and how that compares against the marketplace. Uh, that is done across all beer, wine, spirits, uh, RTDs and non-elk, uh, but non-elk has primarily gone through the grocery channel. So uh, that's kind of the space. So as the report um, that you would have, the charts that I was showing there, uh, I believe there's going to be available afterwards. I think everyone that attended can get access to them. So you can just understand that's sort of what we're looking at. Uh, any questions? Anyone want a beer? Um, you know what's interesting about that? Thank you, Mark, uh, by the way. Uh, what's interesting is our U.S. counterparts were so afraid of the green color that they did everything in like khaki brown. And we were like, khaki brown is not going to stick out when you wrap a building in it. You know, it's like you got to leverage who you are. And that's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, there were a lot of angry customers uh, that year, especially in the West. <laughs> uh, any other uh, questions or praises that you want to give me for brands, brands that I've worked on in the past? <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much, everyone. I am around for today and tomorrow uh, and happy to chat. Cheers. <laughs>